I can't. I cannot express to you um, the journey that we have been on together. Uh, I'm sure you'll see it in one of our documentaries coming soon. Uh, but he is really, he is really an angel who has done all of the work that has possibly done so he can pour into the world and pour in, especially pour into you guys here today. None other than my mentor, Mr. Ryan Blair. Thank you. Is it my turn? Am I up? Are you playing the video or no? Yes. Oh, you are? Okay. You don't have to play the video, Jennifer. Don't worry about it. You guys can listen to my song, though. You guys like the song? Come on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Give it up for Jennifer, everybody. Wasn't she amazing? Come on. Get on your feet, everybody. She invited you out here. Get on your feet and give her a standing ovation. Jennifer, great job. Come on. You guys, what's wrong? You guys... Are you guys a little tired right now? Oh, I feel like you guys are a little tired. You guys, someone need to take a nap? No? Come on, I, I want some more energy in here. I think you guys have it in you. Can't hear me? I don't even need a microphone. I didn't hear you. You guys tired? No. no. You guys here to learn something? All right, I had some slides, but I'm going to go off the script today. Do I have permission to do that? Yes. I'm going to do a little bit of preaching today. I know you, you're ready for it, aren't you? I'm going to do a little bit of preaching. I'm going to do a little bit of teaching as well. You guys ready for it? All right, so there was a video that was going to tell you a little bit about my story, and I'm just going to walk you through it real quick and share with you a little bit about me, just so that way we can make a connection here. I have only one intention here today, though, and that is not for you to connect to me, but that is for you to make a connection with our Heavenly Father and to hear the words that I share with you and the parts of my story that I tender to you, to hear them in such a way that it reminds you of your purpose and of your ability to make an impact and of your reason why and helps you make sense of your journey and helps you take your adversities that you have been through and turn them into your authority. How many of you right now are ready to turn an adversity into an authority? Yes or no? You came here for it. And in fact, I believe, my belief system is that you were called here for a reason. How many of you don't even, didn't know exactly why you were called here but there was a little voice that said, get in that car and get here. Little voice said, I don't know what it is that I'm going to learn, but I'm going to learn something that's going to stick with my soul, that's going to help me in my role, It's going to help me be a better leader, a better father, a better mother. How many of you had a little voice speak to you on the way in this morning? I did. How many of you had another voice speak to you and say, hit this news button? Ah, uh, go, go to the office. It's Friday, take the day off. Sun's out. Go shopping. How many of you had another voice speak to you as well? Tell you not to. That opponent. Tell you, you're not going to learn anything. You're not going to get anything out of this. There's better things to do today. How many of you had an opponent, an opposition force try to stop you from being here today. How many of you overcame that force to be in the room here today by a show of hands? She did. I could see it. Congratulations. So my, my journey, for those of you who have read my book, Nothing to Lose, Everything to Gain, I lost my parents at a young age due to alcohol and drug addiction. My father was a very violent man. And my mother, my poor mother, was abused and violated. I was the youngest of seven children, and so I had to witness a lot of difficulty growing up. By the age of 13 years old, I had no choice but to flee my family home because my father, addicted to drugs, 
had a psychotic break, and I became the enemy in the house, and he was going to kill me. And he told me he was going to kill me. And I took it as real, and I saw the violence and the hands that he laid on my mother and my brothers and my siblings, and I said, I got to leave. So I jumped out of the house. I ran from him last time I ever saw him. 13 years old, he's chasing me. I could outrun him, thank God. And I ran, I had nowhere to go. I wound up in a converted turkey coop in a shack in Los Angeles. I went from a middle class neighborhood to a poor neighborhood. In the middle class, we think we got it all. You know, although on the inside of the house, there was a lot of terrible things, on the outside of the house, it looked pretty good. New clothes at Christmas time, new school clothes in the new school year. Everything looked good. But on the inside of that house, it was terrible. And I ran, I fled that house, and I wound up in a tough neighborhood. Next thing you know, I stand out like a sore thumb in this neighborhood. I'm getting punked every single day. Can't walk outside my house. Getting attacked. My house got robbed. I lived basically on my own, 13 years old, in a lice-infected, rat-infested shack. So I didn't understand how God worked at the time I do now. What I realized is that those things didn't happen to me. See, they happened for me. Because my soul was on a journey to turn adversity into spiritual authority. So I'm no victim by any means whatsoever. Now, I have been a victim, but when you transmute that dark into light, you now have an authority that you can serve to the world unlike anybody else. And each and every single one of you has a story inside of you that needs to be told, and it is my belief that you are here in this room here today to get the inspiration and the courage and the wisdom and the Holy Spirit inside of you to tell that story. How many of you are ready to tell your story? How many of you feel like there's something inside of you that needs to come out? She does. She's ready. You're ready. I love it. Daphne's ready for sure. And so as I went through that journey of hardship, I joined a gang. I know I don't look like it. Everybody always says that. I was able to get away with all kinds of stuff because the cops didn't think I was a part of the gang for a long time. <laughs> Eventually caught up to me and I went to juvenile hall. And I got kicked out of high school like Jennifer. Went to what's called a continuation high school. And I'm in juvenile hall and I'm facing four years in prison. And I was concerned because I knew that I was about 16, about 17 at the time. Say a little, almost 17. And I knew that if I got four years, I'd be sent to prison. If I went to prison, I'd become a professional criminal. I'd have no chance, it's over at that point. Young kid like me, and the gang that I was from, and the environment that I lived in in Los Angeles, I'd have been immediately put to the test as soon as I arrived there and I'd been forced to kill people. And I knew that that was the path I was on. So one night, I'm a high school dropout, I got freshman credits in high school, I'm sitting inside that juvenile hall um, cell, I was in solitary confinement for fighting and I have a Bible in my hand, and that's it. Can't talk to anybody 23 hours a day on lockdown. I got a Bible, and they gave me a pencil and a piece of paper, and I decided after reading the Bible that I'd write the judge a letter. And people said, don't even bother. The judge isn't going to read your letter. The judge wants nothing to do with you. He's mean. He's going to throw you the book, man. Don't even bother. And I said, I, something in me says I got to write a letter. And I had about 20 days to write this letter. And I wrote it. I'm a writer at heart. I didn't know it at the time, but I wasn't much of a speller. So I'd show it to the, the guards, and I'd say, can you spell check this for me? We didn't have spell check back then. And he'd come back, and he'd redline it, and I'd take the piece of paper, and I'd use my best cursive, and I'd write it over and over and over. And I still have stacks of the drafts of this letter. So I cared so much about getting free and about begging for leniency I wrote this letter over and over, and I read that Bible over and over. And then my day would come, it's time for me to be sentenced for armed robbery. Looking at four years, it's a real 
a real case. And I give the, the public defender my letter, and it's like an angel took over the room. The whole energy of the room changed. He just convicted this guy 20 years, 30 years, 10 years, 5 years. I'm sitting there here, and everybody just going to prison. And he's a machine at sending people to prison. He didn't think twice about it. He's like, you're out, you're out. And I'm just like, it's over, it's a wrap. And all of a sudden, an angel takes over. I get emotional just sharing this. Angel takes over the room. The judge begrudgingly reads the letter. I'll never forget. He said, son, you should be writing in college, not in prison. By the grace of God, I was saved in that moment. I never, never in a million years thought I would be a writer writing in college. No one ever had mentioned my name in college in the same sentence. The school counselors told me, you'll never be a doctor. You'll never be a lawyer. You'll never be this. You'll never be that. Society had labeled me a poor kid that came from a bad family with a violent father. They had, they had, they had set me aside. And this judge says, you should go to college. He said, if you ever come back here, though, I'm sending you to prison. So I was scared straight in that moment. I was like, all right, this praying thing kind of works. <laughs> and when I was in that jail cell, I wasn't a great reader, so I'd have to read out loud because I have ADD. My mind would be wandering, and I'd be getting lost as I was reading the Bible. So I'd read it out loud to keep myself focused. And I would hear the echoes in the rooms because it was a concrete room as I was reading the Bible out loud. And I thought, am I going to be a preacher? <laughs> and here today I stand before you. I am a preacher of the good Lord and his work in people's lives. See, I had what we call an altar call moment. That's the name of the movement that I created at a young age. I didn't realize it at the time. But I had an altar call moment, a moment of change, a moment of awareness. There's a force at work that we cannot see, but it is at work inside of you and inside of this room right here and right now if you are willing to receive it and if you are willing to drink deeply from it. See, I connected with that force in that moment. I was granted that leniency and I went on to see myself not as a poor kid from a poor family, but I saw myself as a writer going to college. And that's what I did. I got distance from my old friends. I got myself a job. And next thing you know, I got a mentor in the real estate industry. Now, I know I'm among some real estate people. And everybody in the room pretty much here, a lot of you all from real estate, right? Yeah. So guess what my first job was in real estate? Serving for closure eviction notices. At the time, I was 260 pounds. I got tattoos all over me. I was a mean kid. So I was the perfect kid to get you out of the house pretty quickly. I'd show up with that foreclosure notice, and I'd say, it's time to move on. And they'd tell me they had 90 days, and I'd say, you don't have 90 days. Time to move on. I'd push them out of the house as fast as I could because my mentor, that was his money, and they were stealing from my mentor by sitting in that house and not paying rent. And I didn't like that. So I did my job well. I served those foreclosure notices. And next thing you know, my mentor allowed me to shadow invest inside some of his properties. I could put $100 into this property, $100 into that property, $100 into that property, and I got to shadow him in his building of a business. And that was when I decided I was going to become an entrepreneur. See, I, I didn't do well in school whatsoever. I was told I'd never amount to nothing. I was told I couldn't be a doctor or I couldn't be a lawyer. But all of a sudden, a thought went off in my head, and I asked myself, who writes the checks to the doctors and the lawyers? Entrepreneurs. So I said, I can't be a doctor, don't have the aptitude, didn't go to college. Can't be a lawyer, although I knew a lot about the law system. I was pretty versed in the, the criminal law uh, system. I could tell you all about different violations and so forth. I wasn't going to be a lawyer. But I could be the person to write the check 
to the doctor and the lawyer. I could be the CEO of a company that has doctors and has lawyers. How come they don't teach us that in school? How come they don't teach us that entrepreneurship is one of the best career professions you could possibly engage in? They teach you to go to school, to get a job, and as the speaker before me said, to live a life paycheck to paycheck, just over broke. And all of a sudden, I see this man in the real estate industry buying and selling foreclosures, and he had a number of rentals. And I see him living the life that I saw on MTV Cribs. I see him living the life of my dreams. I couldn't shoot a jump shot, I couldn't rap, I couldn't act, but I could do this thing called entrepreneurship. So that's when I started my journey. I'm now 45 years old. I'm 25 years into my journey as an entrepreneur. I've built and sold companies to the tune of billions of dollars. I've had $2 billion personally roll through my hands. And I don't share that with you lightly because God has entrusted me as a steward of that money to experiment with it, to learn with it, to grow with it, and deploy that into the hands of many souls. I've personally cut checks for hundreds of millions to many different people in my journey as an entrepreneur. And through the 25 years worth of experience and the $2 billion worth of experimentation, I have learned a lot. And like I told you, I was gonna partly preach today and partly teach. You guys ready for the teaching part? Yeah. I didn't hear you. Yeah. All right, I guess you're not ready. So thank you guys. Are you ready for the teaching part? Yeah. Are you ready? All right. Number one thing I'm going to teach you based on my experience, and I've taught you a few things today in, uh, in my storytelling, but the number one thing I'm going to teach you is that suffering visits us all. And right now, some of you are suffering. You know, the real estate market changed on us. Rates went up, inflation's through the roof. Some of you might have a little bit of fear, rightfully so, going on. Anyone want to be honest, be truthful? Any of you have a little bit of fear right now? A little bit? I got you. I've been there. I've been through ups and downs, highs and lows, just like what we're going through right now. Now, I have to tell you something I've learned about suffering. Think of suffering as the best teacher in the world. Don't be afraid of suffering. That's not why suffering is coming for a visit. See, suffering, think of it like a professor. When professor suffering shows up, it's not there for you to run from it because if you run from it, you know what it's gonna do? It's gonna chase. It's gonna chase you until it catches you. See, suffering is here to deliver a lesson. It's a teacher. And so you gotta learn to dance with suffering. How many of you can dance? Come on. I can't, but I can dance with suffering, that's for sure. And when the lesson comes, you gotta extract the gold from it. Because if you extract the wrong lesson from it, the teacher will reappear. It'll show up in a new body. It'll show up in a new form, but it'll be the same exact lesson. And the lesson will repeat itself over and over and over until you learn it. That's why some people, you ever meet somebody that just seems like they keep repeating the same lesson over and over? I got some friends, and they'll call me up and they'll be like, she cheated on me again. And I'll be like, don't you see the pattern? <laughs> like, you're the only friend I know that has this bad of luck, right? See, suffering will repeat the lesson until you get it, and then once you get it, you are freed from it. So if you're suffering right now, I suggest you take out a piece of paper and you write down what you're suffering from, and then you write down every possible lesson that it could be here to teach you. Maybe it's here to teach you to grow some character. Maybe it's here to teach you to pay closer attention to who you surround yourself with. Maybe it's here to teach you to have better financial discipline. Maybe it's here to teach you to get closer to your faith. Maybe it's here to teach you to take your hands off the steering wheel and let God do some of the driving in your life. I can get an amen for that. Amen. amen. See, suffering's here to teach us something. Now, if we see ourselves as victims, we go, I'm a victim of suffering. Guess what? 
professor suffering is going to keep showing up and keep showing up and keep showing up until you learn the lesson. And some people, it stays with them for the, their whole lives. Because the lesson they learn is that they're a victim, or the lesson that they learn is that it's other people's problems, or the lesson that they learn is that it's outside of them as opposed to inside of them. And so when it shows up, learn the lesson, and then you move on to higher lessons. And the other thing that I'll tell you about suffering that I've learned throughout my journey is one, never suffer from suffering. But we tend to get into a loop where something bad's happening and we think about the negativity of the something that's bad that's happening over and over and over again and that's suffering from suffering. I tell my team members and the people that I mentor is I don't suffer from suffering. We all are going to suffer. That's part of the journey of life. But if we suffer from suffering, Professor suffering is going to stick with us for a long time. Once we learn that lesson, we graduate from it and we graduate to higher level lessons. So that's, that's, that's one of the things that I've learned about this life, is how to overcome that suffering. Now, how many of you want to deal with the higher level professors, professors that are dealing in light, for example? How many of you want more light in your life? Can I teach you, want me to teach you a secret to bring in more light into your life? The number one secret? This is gonna make you a straight up ninja in all that you do. All you gotta do to bring more light in your life is transmute the dark. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's it. See, as entrepreneurs, we have to solve problems. That's what an entrepreneur does. It solves a problem, right? We got to solve problems on the inside of our walls, inside of us, to be the leaders that we're capable of so that we can solve the problems on the outside of our walls. Does that make sense? So if you have all kinds of problems on the inside of your walls, how are you going to solve the problems on the outside of your walls? And the outside of your walls represents your customers' problems, the problems within the marketplace, the problems that your entrepreneurial vehicle are here to solve, right? That's all an entrepreneur is, is a problem solver. But if you don't know how to transmute that dark into light, and you allow that dark to continue to grow on you, then what's going to happen? Eventually, you're going to be filled with negativity. And each and every single one of us has a vessel. Now, in the Bible, they call it a cleave. Any of you familiar with this concept called a vessel? Each of us has a vessel. It's like a container. In that container, you have dark, and in that container, you have light. And in order to shine your light bright, you got to transmute that dark. You got to get out the shovels and dig out the mud from your vessel. And each and every single day when a negative thing happens, you have to change your mindset to see it as an, as an opportunity for you to transmute dark into light. You have conflict in your work environment, you're gonna run from it, or are you gonna transmute that, that dark into light? Sales are down, you're gonna run from it, go get a drink, go numb yourself, you're gonna transmute that negativity into positivity. Inflation's up, supply chain problems, real estate market issues, right? These things are happening on the outside of our walls. The only thing that we can do when stuff's falling apart on the outside of our walls is turn to the inside. And by turning to the inside, I mean not only turn to get to know your soul, but to get to know the author of the soul, the creator of the soul. And when you get to know the creator of the soul by way of getting to know your own soul, that's when you start to shine the most light that you could possibly imagine. So how many of you learned something from that? Transmuting dark into light. For those of you that are into martial arts, I like boxing and uh, jiu-jitsu and judo and a variety of other martial arts. Some of you, any of you familiar with what uh, judo is as a martial art? The idea of judo is you take on your opponent's energy and you transmute it. And you can see a judo master could be a frail, 80-year-old man, 300-pound man, 300 man comes and attacks that frail 80-year-old man, and he could just take that and just push that person with all the force against them straight into a wall because they know how to turn that negativity into positivity. Now, the next thing you have to think about in order to go through a pure transformation is you've got to change your language. Now, I knew that growing up on the streets in Los Angeles, 
I had a bad vocabulary. I still do, but God has a lot of patience with me. I repent pretty much as my part-time job. And I do my very best to try to eliminate these negative words, especially in the presence of children, my 13-year-old boy included. The, uh, the language that we utilize is an indicator of our consciousness level. I don't need the slides up there, but those are my childhood pictures for those of you who are following along. But I don't need the slides up. Thank you, though. The language that we utilize is an indicator of our level of consciousness, our level of light, our level of awareness. Each and every single day we are transmitting. We are sending out a signal to say, here's where I'm at, here's where I'm at. And we are attracting people that are at our frequency. And so if we're talking negatively and thinking negatively, we're going to attract people that are talking negatively and thinking negatively. And so one of the key ingredients to change is to change your language. Now, some of the words that we have to change, as opposed to saying, I have to do this showing today, I have to call back this customer, I have to do this, or I have to have a long work day, right? Any of you ever catch yourself saying that? You look at that calendar and you're like, today's going to be a long one. How many of you have ever had that language, right? See, the key is to, to change that language, no longer say, I have to, but say, I get to. So I get to do that call. I get to do that showing. I get to call that customer back. I get to show up even though times are tough. So we got to change I have to to I get to because that will expand you. That will open up more light in your life. See, each of us, like I said, has that vessel filled with negativity and positivity. And when we shift I have to to I can, or I get to, then all of a sudden we have more gratitude. And when we have more gratitude in our lives, what do you think happens? That vessel starts to shine even brighter. And you might not know this, but right now you might have a small vessel, meaning you have scarcity, you have fear. But as you do this work that I'm here to teach you, that vessel is going to purify. And that light is going to start to shine. And then that vessel is going to expand. And pretty soon you'll walk into a room and people will just be like, can we do business together? See, right now, as we speak, the Holy Spirit is in this room. I can feel it 100%. Right now. And there are, there are waves. There are waves, spiritual waves, that are happening all around you as I share these words with you. They're happening all around. All you've got to learn to do is be in position for it. See, we think we've got to go chase. We think we've got to hustle. We think we've got to grind. You don't. All you got to do is purify your soul and your heart and get in position and let God do the driving in your life. I'm here to share this with you. And the more you purify your soul and the more you purify your heart and the more you humble yourself and the more you take notes and the more you become a student and the more you dive into the good book, the more God can work in your life and the more you'll start to see, see synchronicities in your life the more you'll start to experience serendipity in your life, and the more miracles will enter your life. I'm here today to give you a formula for how to bring miracles into your life because my life is a miracle. I never imagined, never imagined in a million years that I'd be here today after the adversity that I've faced to be able to share with you the wisdom that I have learned by the grace of God. I never imagined it. But when I was in that jail cell in Juvenile Hall, I was pacing back and forth, praying that I could get out, begging, begging God for forgiveness. He answered the deal that I made. And so I'm here to honor that deal and to pay it forward with as many people as I possibly can and share the wisdom that has been blessed, that I've been blessed to receive in my life, that has been bestowed to me. So you change your language, you're going to change your life. Start observing it. Start writing down when you use negative language. Just write it down. Now I'm going to give you another secret that's going to change your life forever. You'll never be the same when I give you this secret. Anyone want it? Yeah. All right. That's all right. That's it, guys. I appreciate you very much. You can find out the secret in my next book. Uh, I won't sell you my next book here. I'll, sell you. I'll give it to you right now. You ready for it? Yeah. Do you want to know the, the secret 
to overcoming a negative thought? No? Yes. Replace it with a positive thought. Every time I have a negative thought, I replace it with a positive thought. Oh, that Mike, he must be doing something wrong. He's making too much money. Wait, maybe Mike over there is doing something right and I could go learn from Mike over there. Yeah. Oh, those, those people that bought that new house, they're going to lose it. Wait, I'm going to pray for them, for them to keep that house and make sure that they live in that house and they get all the value out of that new house. Oh, society's against me. It's a, it's a trap. It's a scam. I'm never going to win. I'm being held down. No, wait. Somebody that is no smarter than me figured their way out of the hole similar to the one I'm in, and they made it, and so I'm going to go learn from them. So you've got to replace those negative thoughts with positive thoughts every time they show up. And when you do that, you rewire the programming in your soul, and you start to shine that light that I'm here to help you find within you and start to shine. Now, that's the antidote for a negative thought. But you want to know what the cure is? Yes. Yes. See, you guys are finally catching up here. I, I, this, this speech could go much faster if I get participation. Thank you. The cure is you've got to evaluate the underlining misconception, the lie that you believe in in this moment, the truth, the, the lack of truth that you've been told, the... the the limiting belief that you're buying into. So once you say, all right, I had this negative thought, what's the positive to replace it? Then you say, what belief created this negative thought? What limiting belief can I remove right here and now? And that's like getting into the operating system that is you and rewriting the code at the foundational level. And when you evaluate that misconception that you're buying into a lie, or you evaluate that limiting belief and you change it to a new positive belief, what do you think starts to happen? That operating system that's called you starts to become more efficient. Doesn't crash as much. Doesn't have as much fear in its life. And I'm here today to help you get a total upgrade, not just a do-over, but a total upgrade to the way that you think, the way that you act, so that you can become an agent of impact. Starting to preach again. You got, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. So we've talked about changing some things. Now I'm going to give you a couple more pieces of teaching. They're going to change your life forever because it's changed mine. And I've helped thousands. I, right now I have 80,000 plus students that I've helped in the journey of this movement that I created called Altar Call. I'm going to give you another key principle that I've learned, and this was the hardest. See, I was very impulsive. Any of you have a little bit of impulsive tendencies? One of mine was shopping. I, I would go shopping, and I couldn't just buy, like, one watch. I had to buy, like, ten of them. I couldn't just buy one house. I had to buy, like, four houses on the street. Couldn't just buy one of the bags. I had to buy, like, four or five sets of them. I'm like, why do I need five sets of luggage, Right? You only really need one set of luggage. I was impulsive. But my impulsiveness uh, wasn't just shopping. I was impulsive in other things, too. I was impulsive in uh, living a decadent rock star lifestyle, AKA drugs, alcohol, promiscuity, some other things like that, too. I had, a, I had an impulsive nature. And I thought that was just me. I thought that was impossible for me to change. I was like, all you other people could talk about purity. All you other people could talk about discipline. That's not for me. I'll never be disciplined. I thought discipline was a foreign word. I thought it was just for military people and boring people. Any of you understand what I'm talking about here? You know, like when people say, you got to be more disciplined. Any of you are like, please speak to someone else about that discipline stuff. Until I learn this secret. And it changed my life forever. I learned about this spiritual concept called restriction. It's not discipline. Discipline, that requires a whole lot of work. But restriction means I'm just going to say no to the, to the small light so I could say yes to the big light. 
So say no to that shopping spree so I could say yes to a vacation. Say no to the short-term negativity so I could say yes to the long-term positivity. Say no to the sugar so I could say yes to better energy. Say no to five glasses of wine, that was my issue, so I could say yes to working out in the morning and showing up my best. Say no to anger so I could say yes to peace. Say no to my triggers, the things that would trigger me, so I could say yes to patience. See, the things that we learn to say no to, now that is the path, that is the secret to being a human being. Because we know how to say yes. We know how to say yes to way too many things. But we gotta learn how to say no. And when you learn how to say no, you learn to focus. When you learn to focus, you get concentration. When you get concentration, you can actually get to a level of mastery. And once you get to a level of mastery, what do you think happens to your income? We, we in our society, pay people the best money in the world for their level of mastery. Jennifer Hudson, anybody? She's got a level of mastery. When you hear her sing, what do you hear? You hear that mastery. We pay people by their level of mastery. And if you want a level of mastery in your life, whether it be in sales and leadership and operations and technology, whatever it is that you want a level of mastery in, you're going to get there by saying no to things. I have two friends that are celloists, you know, the, the big violin. You guys know what I'm talking about, the cello? They're both Carnegie Hall, world-class, world-leading cellists, celloists. They practice 10 hours a day to get there, and now that they're famous and successful, they practice eight hours a day. The other day I was with her, one of my friends, and she showed me her hands, and her hands are just eaten alive by those strings. And she's one of the very best that there ever was in the world at this. And she still is practicing eight hours a day to get better. And she's getting paid great wages. She has huge fame. She's one of the best there ever was. And yet she's still practicing eight hours a day. Now, how do you practice eight hours a day? You got to say no to some stuff. See, God loves a soul who practices. God loves it when you practice. God loves it when you humble yourself. You become a student and you're willing to practice the thing that you seek to be a master of. Whether you want to be a writer, you want to be an author, you want to build an empire, you want to lead a team, you better practice. And so I encourage you right now to write down the things that you need to be doing some more practicing of. One of the things that I practice is not only presentation and speaking and writing and so forth, but one of, the, one of the other things I practice, I practice singing. You know why I practice singing? Because I can't sing at all. <laughs> in fact, if you were to vote who the worst singer in the history of the world was when I started practicing singing, it would be me. No musical aptitude whatsoever. No one sang in the household. But one day God said to me that the path to me becoming a better speaker was to learn how to sing. And I was like, you must be talking to someone else. That, that must be the devil speaking, because you want me to sing? Next thing you know, I got a singing coach. You might want to guess how much I pay my singing coach per year? 50000 a year. 50000 a year I pay my singing coach for two and a half years now. Not because I want to become a singer, although it would be cool if one day I'm up here singing this speech to you. Why do you think I, why do you think I pay $50,000 a year to learn to sing? because it helps me get to know my voice. Because it helps me get to know my soul, because the voice is the sound of the soul. And so $50,000 a year is a small price to pay to get to learn about the most important muscles we have in our body, our voice. But I wouldn't have got there had I not learned the principle of practice and not learned that God loves it when you practice. So right now, you want success and you want goals, and there's gonna be people that are gonna tell you, write down your goals, and I'm here to tell you, you already know all that stuff. You already know what you want. Write down the things that you're willing to sacrifice and give up to get there. Write down the things that you are willing to restrict. 
Are you, you want to be a millionaire, but will you restrict that third glass of wine at dinner time to be a millionaire? You want to be healthy and be fit, but will you restrict that late night extravaganza you like to do? Or that late night sugar, or that late night whatever it is that you're getting into? See, we have to learn to say no so that we can say yes. And Steve Jobs said, focus is saying no. And that is the secret to my success is I learned how to say no. And eventually, once you learn how to restrict at a micro level, and you say, God, what do you want me to restrict? See, for me, it was the big ones, like the seven deadly sins I had to restrict, right? That is pretty obvious. And then it got into the micro restrictions. I had to restrict, as Jennifer said earlier, the news. I had to restrict negative thinking. It got into more abstract things, right? The, the big things that we need to restrict in our day and age and society is we need to restrict any negativity that's coming our way. We need to restrict the negative news media. We need to restrict the negative politicians that are trying to program us to be victims, tell us that, you know, that we're victims of the healthcare system, that we're victims of this, victims of that. We need to restrict those voices that are trying to program us for their good, not for ours. Yep. Restrict the music in our culture, oftentimes that's a key ingredient. Restrict our desire to binge drink, binge watch, and binge eat. Yep. And once you add up all of those restrictions, you're going to step forward and people are going to call you disciplined. I, I could not believe it the first time I heard somebody say, that Ryan, he's so disciplined. I was like, what? <laughs> like, I never thought I'd mas get a level of mastery over that word. There was other things that made me great, but discipline was not one of them. But all of a sudden, I restricted these many things. I restricted enough of them that my heart purified, and now it's, much, it's, it's easy to be disciplined for me. So I've given you the formula to become more disciplined. I've given you the formula today to transmute dark into light. I've given you the formula to change your level of consciousness, to change your language. I've given you the formula to overcome your adversity and to turn it into your spiritual authority. Before I go, can I give you one last formula? Yes. Now, this is going to take 100% of your participation. Can I, can I do that? Yeah. All right. This one is going to require us to go deep into our soul right now. We're going to have to turn off our heads and open up our hearts if we can do that. Yeah. I need every heart in the room connected in this moment if I can ask for that privilege. So what I want to do is I want to call the Creator into the room, the Holy Spirit into the room, and I want to ask the Creator to plant some seeds of transformation in every single one of us here today. Is anyone open to that? Yeah. Now, the way we're going to do that is the most powerful formula ever invented in the world. This is the formula that I have lived by to change my life. And many lives have been transformed from that. And that's the power of prayer. Yeah. But most of you don't know how to pray correctly because you were taught perhaps wrong. See, we've got to pray from our heart. We've got to pray like King David prayed. We got to pray from a place. King David said, God, I am poor and needy when he was not poor and needy. But what was he doing? He was putting himself into a position where he was vulnerable, he was open, and he was willing to let the Creator come in and open up that door, right? See, all too often we pray from our heads, not from our hearts. When you pray from your head, you're not going to get anything. But when you pray from your heart, the Creator will do His magic. It is a guaranteed 100%. Now, I need each of you, though, in order for us to pray together to conclude this portion of our experience together. I need each of you to think about the thing that we want to put at the Creator's feet, that we want to let go of right now, that we want to restrict, that we want to say goodbye to. Maybe it's our old self. Maybe, maybe the you that showed up here today is going to get a rebirth. Maybe you want to say goodbye to the old version of you so you could say hello to a new version of you. Maybe that will be your prayer, that you're ready to walk away and be reborn today. Maybe that'll be what comes into your heart. Maybe you'll ask the Creator to do some work in someone you love. Maybe you have someone suffering from addiction in your life. Maybe you have someone suffering from a health challenge. Maybe that's a health challenge of your own. 
So as we pray together, I just want you to think about what we want to put together because there's an old saying, and the saying goes where two or more are gathered. Any of you heard that one? I got the chills when I just told it to you. So I'm just going to ask you all to bow your heads, close your eyes, and open your hearts. And from that child of God that you are, from that inner child, go to that inner child when you're filled with light, filled with innocence, filled with purity, before the world hardened your heart. I want you to connect to that inner child of yours. And I want you to call God into the room and say, God, I am here. Your child is here. I am your child and I need you right now, God. I need you now more than ever. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. I'm ready to grow my character. I'm ready to grow in my faith. I'm ready to serve. I'm ready to surrender and submit to your grace and your mercy. So Heavenly Father, I thank you for gathering us here today. I thank you for the privilege of being able to lead this prayer. I thank you for every soul that is connected here today, Father. I beg of you, I ask you to please plant the seeds of transformation into the hearts that are in this room and to lead those in this room that are called to lead to the next level in their life, to lead them to leave behind the things that are holding them back, to leave behind the toxic relationships and toxic substances, to leave behind the past so that they can step into a new life, a new way of being where you are doing the driving and where they can overcome fear with their faith each and every single day and they can grow in your honor. I say this humbly in your name. Amen. I'm Ryan Blair. Thank you guys very much. God bless you guys. Thank you.